Hey everyone, I'm Andrew, and on this super spooky special episode of Yellow Spandex, we're looking at the fearsome fashion icon from Friday the 13th. This is the evolution of Jason Voorhees. Jason's grisly glow up cemented him as a slasher icon, but it took him a few movies to find his style. Let's start with his formative fashion. Outside of the legendary final jump scare, We don't see much of Jason in the first Friday, but the basic design by horror legend Tom Savini would inform Jason's look for the rest of the series. A bulbous, bald head and a facial deformity that makes his eye droop down towards his cheek. Jason takes center stage in part two, where he wore his best overalls and flannel for his big time debut and covered up his head with a burlap sack that only had one hole for his good eye. Damn. I can't see fucking shit out of this thing. Under the hood, our first glimpse of adult Jason is more rampaging redneck than rage-fueled revenant, with jacked up teeth, scraggly red hair, and a copious neck beard. <laughs> when it came time for a third film, Jason made three huge changes to his aesthetic that would last for the rest of the series. He lost his wispy ginger locks, stole a dark green work shirt and gray pants, and acquired his iconic hockey mask, courtesy of prankster Shelby Finkelstein. Show me Shelby Finkelstein! Stop fooling around, man! There's no in-story reasoning why Jason likes to dress up as a goalie, and behind the scenes, the mask was just sort of a happy accident. See, during a routine lighting test, the crew needed to cover up the Jason actor's face, and the 3D supervisor just happened to be a huge hockey fan. And I must admit, in modesty, that I put the hockey mask on Jason. He had an old Detroit Red Wings goalie mask candy, but it was a little too small. So they used a vacuum form mold to cast a bigger, batter replica. And lo, a legend was born. In part four, Jason's outfit is more or less identical to part three, only with a nasty crack in his mask, courtesy of an ax to the face. A detail that will remain constant throughout the series. One thing that's never really consistent though, is how Jason looks when he inevitably gets unmasked. Part three's Jason had a face only a mother could love, but it's nowhere near the monster we'd expect him to be. So Tom Savini returned to update his original vision for a grown-up Jason in what was supposed to be his last appearance. <laughs> but that ain't how Hollywood works, baby. Part four was billed as the final chapter, and it was the last time we'd see a living, breathing human Jason in the original series. But Mama Voorhees demanded more blood, so for the back half of the Friday franchise, Jason was revived as an indestructible force hellbent on destruction during the zombie years. But before we start raising the dead, we should address the black sheep of the franchise, The New Beginning, and it's Jason wannabe Roy Burns. I'll give the producers credit for sticking to their guns with the whole final chapter thing, and I actually kind of love the jumpsuit and blue chevrons on his mask, but Roy was a poor substitute for Crystal Lake's favorite son. When the real deal finally returned and Jason lives, he's still wearing the same clothes he stole in part three. That's continuity, baby, that's what I'm talking about, callbacks. It's just tattered and rotted after spending the last few years six feet under. Jason upgrades his gear with a nifty utility belt to hold all of his implements of murder like some kind of fed up Batman. I am vengeance. I am the knight. I am Batman. And some yellow gloves to hold his sliced in half hand together. Beneath the mask, Jason's body is a writhing mess of worms and maggots that you never saw coming. You never see it coming and while we don't get a full view of his face, when we see it in the new blood, Jason is revealed as a rotting, monstrous ghoul with decaying flesh and exposed bone. God damn, he's ugly. Time to start the day! 
This was fan favorite Kane Hodder's first appearance as Jason, and he wore basically the same outfit as Jason lives, plus some gnarly chains used to sink him to the bottom of Crystal Lake. Real heavy metal shit. But the real innovation of the new blood was how well it sold the beatings Jason has taken throughout the years. On top of the trademark axe crack, the lower part of his mask is still broken away after making out with a boat propeller in part six. And you can actually see his spine and ribcage poking through his skin after years of death and destruction. The continuity nods are appreciated, but then Jason takes Manhattan and pretty much just throws it all out of the window. For one thing, his outfit has magically repaired itself, only now it's inexplicably dripping wet wherever he goes. Also, after his original mask was destroyed at the end of New Blood, Jason finds a new one that conveniently has the exact same axe wound from part three. It's a very cool look, although the unmasking scene was a little underwhelming, considering his face was being melted by toxic waste at the time. You hate to see it. Maybe that's why he's so jacked up at the beginning of Jason Goes to Hell. Just a big bloated monstrosity that doesn't even come close to looking like a human. With his mask, or what's left of it, permanently embedded in his face. Of course, he doesn't stay in this body for long after the FBI blows him away in the most brilliant sting since Goodfellas. <laughs> bye bye, dickhead. <laughs> See you in Attica, dick. Jason spends most of the movie as a wriggling little worm monster. Jason Goes to Hell was subtitled The Final Friday, but it's hard to keep a good slasher down, plus they couldn't get Chris Tucker or Ice Cube to sign off on it. I know you don't smoke weed. I know this. But I'm gonna get you high today. Cause it's Friday, you ain't got no job, and you ain't got shit to do. Still, this was the end of the classic era, and Jason would never look quite so cool again. Cause now, well, now we've entered the dork age. Nearly a decade after the final Friday, Jason joined the ranks of Pinhead, the Leprechaun, Homer Simpson, and other pop culture icons who've been blasted into space. Jason X added a tan jacket, fingerless gloves, and little tufts of hair to his earthbound attire. Along with a brand new mask, it's more angular than the smooth curves that we're used to. I hate it. Of course, the real makeover came courtesy of some nano machines that upgraded the titular killer into a gleaming metal cyborg, as if he wasn't scary enough. What the hell is going on? Jason fing Borges, that's what's going on. Uber Jason was fine, I guess, but he just doesn't feel like Jason. He looks like Lord Zed crossed with a Doctor Who villain, and even the concept art looks like something I would have seen on DeviantArt in 2003. Sadly, this was Kane Hodder's final appearance under the mask. For Freddy vs. Jason, the producers allegedly wanted an actor who would tower over the diminutive Master of Dreams. So they replaced Hodder with Ken Krasinger, who was a whopping two inches taller. Invite only corn poke, and you weren't invited! Son of a bitch. Jason kept things casual for his big crossover with a bulky brown coat over a torn gray sweatshirt. And the mask is back to the classic design with one huge exception. For the first time since part three, the ax crack has completely disappeared. I wonder how many hours it took for them to achieve that effect. Is this blatant disrespect for the series canon the reason it was rebooted in 2009? All I can say is probably. Jason in the Friday the 13th remake still isn't the sharpest knife in the drawer, but this version shows off a lot more intelligence than his berserker counterpart. He can shoot arrows, build traps, and apparently so, since he's wearing a stitched together coat that's half military, half hunting jacket. The mask was reportedly cast from the same mold used for part three, and underneath the crew developed their most extensive makeup yet. Jason's face combines the hairy hillbilly look from part two with Savini's definitive look from the final chapter and incorporates a full upper body prosthesis that gives him a thick, veiny neck and a hump on his back for whatever reason, probably to put water or some snacks in. The remake is sort of a Jason's greatest hits, showing his evolution from a bullied little kid to the classic burlap sack and finally the full on hockey mask. It's a decent enough tribute but that's nothing compared to the love poured into Friday the 13th, the game. The game itself might have been 
wonky as f but you can't deny the developers die hard love for the series. It had gruesomely detailed skins for nearly every iteration of the Crystal Lake Killer, even the weird purple and green color scheme from the NES game, which happens to be my personal favorite. And a hellacious new design dreamed up by Tom Savini. Sadly, legal squabbles over the rights have put the future of the game and the Friday the 13th franchise as a whole in jeopardy. Legal squabbles, the scariest monster of them all. But if we know anything about Jason Voorhees, it's that he's damn hard to kill. Thanks for watching everybody. We've been expanding Yellow Spandex beyond superheroes and we'd love to do more episodes about horror icons. Let us know which slashers you'd like to see unsewn. As always, please subscribe to Now This Nerd and if you see Jason Voorhees, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. You're